So my name is Michael Goldberg. I am the executive director of the Beal Institute for Entrepreneurship at Case Western Reserve. And I also uh, have the privilege of teaching uh, in our Weatherhead School of Management. I see a couple of my colleagues and my dean is on. Hey, Manoj, how are you? Um, so it's great. It's great to have you all here. Um, and uh, I want to thank the, the Scout RFP team for joining today. This is a thrill. Um, obviously, we all celebrated the amazing exit news of your sale to Workday um, in the fall. And uh, it's great to have you here today. This is part of a speaker series we launched in the beginning of this year when we were back at Thinkbox and doing a lot of these things in person, but we had sort of committed to sharing via Zoom and Facebook. So during the crisis and as we move to online delivery, we've really been ramping up a lot of these activities and it's an awesome way to reconnect with, um, with alums and hear their story. We've got a number of folks who are on um, the Zoom today and people that are watching on Facebook and I'd encourage folks, this is a very interactive session, so I'll turn it over shortly to Igor, who's our student moderator. All of our, of our speaker series are moderated by students, which is great. So it gives um, students like Igor that are already incredibly accomplished a chance to do something new, uh, which is moderating a session. So I will turn it over to him and he will lead the session. So just let um, Igor know either in our, our chat message or sort of raise your, your virtual hand in um, Zoom or even your real hand and um, Igor will open up to questions and it'll be interactive. We'll have you for an hour. So with that, Igor, let me turn it over to you. I see Stan is waiting um, and we're admitting him now and take it away, Igor. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for coming to the session today. My name is Igor Tudel. I'm an integrated study student at Case, so I just finished up my bachelor's in accounting, and now I'm working on my master's in accounting and data analytics. Um, while at Case, I've also been involved in entrepreneurship, like our four founders that we have on today. Uh, I started a company called Pastry Now, which is an online on-demand uh, bakery for college students. Uh, with all of the recent circumstances, we're restructuring for, for the time being, but we hope to be back at it soon. Um, as Michael mentioned, we have four entrepreneurs here that are Case alum. Uh, yeah, Alex Yakubovich, Stan Garber, Chris Crane, and Andrew Durlach. So I'm going to read off um, and give you guys a little bit of background on these incredibly successful alumni. And then uh, I'm going to kick off the session with just an introductory question. And then after that, uh, I'm going to open it up to everybody to submit your questions through the chat. And I'll call on you, and if you don't want to speak yourself, uh, I can ask the question for you. So without further ado, um, today we have Alex here, who is a co-founder and CEO at Scout. He sets the business direction and strategy for the company. Previously, he was a co-founder in Enosis with Stan, which was acquired by Living Social in 2012. And at Enosis, he led the operations team and helped the, helped the company become one of the largest online ordering providers in the country. Prior to this, he went to Case where he studied mechanical engineering. And outside of work, you can find Alex running marathons, reading autobiographies, um, though not necessarily at the same time. Next, we have Stan. Stan is the co-founder and president of Scar Scout RFP. And he sets Scout's growth strategy and leads go-to market activities. Previously, he co-founded Enosis with Alex, which, as I mentioned, is a digital ordering platform for restaurant chains, and which was acquired by Living Social in 2012. There, he led business development and financial functions. Stan is a finance and management graduate of Case. Chris is the co-founder and leads product vision and high-level strategy at Scout. He brings together his passion for building solutions to make life easier and extensive engineering experience. Prior to Scout, he focused on improving efficiency and manufacturing process and machine design at Arico. Today, his mission is to make the world of sourcing simpler for all. He's a mechanical engineering graduate of Case. And Andrew is the co-founder and VP operations at Scout RFP. He's responsible for finance and business operations activities. Prior to Scout, he focused on management-led private equity investments at Prospect Partners and executed M&A transactions at Harris Williams & Co. 
Andrew is a finance and management graduate of Case Western Reserve University. So just to kick it off with one question, uh, I'd like to ask you guys, and the batting order that we're gonna take is uh, Stan, Alex, Chris, and Andrew for this question. What is it about you that made you successful? Wow, that, that's like a deep question to start off all of this. Uh, but uh, also just uh, things, and then also just want to say hi and, and thanks for having us to everybody here. Uh, really, really excited. I know Michael reached out to us. Um, we've been had a chance to chat for, for a little while. Just really excited. Um, and, you know, just uh, before I get into this, but just like Case Western was a big, uh, just this is really good to talk to, to a lot of peers. And, and for one of my professors, Scott Fine, just pinged me too to say hi. Like, it's awesome to sort of talk to so many folks, really. A one fall swoop. Um, I think the one thing uh, from a success standpoint, for me at least, uh, I would say it's uh, my parents, uh, my dad in particular. I, I think just sort of setting up an early career, just sort of uh, coming in very similar to yourself, Igor, just sort of uh, coming in as an immigrant, just sort of seeing him work and just sort of him uh, basically saying like, you can do anything you want, just finish college and be successful. That's all I need from you. So I thought that was a, was a very clear indication to go get it done, at least for me. Pretty sure, Alex, I don't know about you. I think for me, it's probably focus. Uh, I'm a big fan of to-do lists and just doing one thing at a time. Uh, but I, yeah, I think the focus for me is, is the one attribute, one thing. And for me, I would say it's being willing to keep trying. Um, we, we fail a lot, but we're willing to keep going. And I, I would say that goes for all of us. Yeah, it, it, I think that on my part, um, just always trying to move the ball forward and never letting yourself getting, uh, bogged down, whether emotionally or otherwise, and just looking at how you can attack a problem, breaking it down into smaller pieces and just keep, keep thinking to the future with, with a healthy dose of optimism while you do it. Thanks guys, thank you. Um, I know Stan and I share a somewhat similar story, both being immigrants of the Cleveland area and our fathers even worked together at some point. Um, what has been your guys' greatest passion over the last few years and what has really, I think, or what has really driven you um, coming out of case, past stenosis and into Scout? What, what remains your greatest passion? Uh, you know, I, I think it's just personal growth. I think it's been sort of fun and uh, and I can tell you, you know, since we started, you know, with Onesis to Scout to, and Alex, Chris, and Andrew and I have sort of spoken about this, like really getting outside your comfort zone. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's sort of cliche to say uh, this constant of like, you know, you're not learning if you're not outside, but it really is true. Like Alex and I, we looked at each other occasionally, we started like, are you learning stuff? And it's like, yeah, I'm scared every day because I don't know why I'm like, 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 the failure is, is an option, but to us, we always said, like, we got to go make it work. People have trusted us with money, and it's still crazy to think about when um, uh, our first investors, Lee Zappas, when we did Honestus, like, they invested uh, half a million dollars into our company. Alex, I don't think we even finished the full, I don't know if we finished the full business plan. We sort of wrote it. We sold them. It was a good idea, but, like, someone handed you half a million dollars coming out of college. Well, not, not that full amount right away, but still a lot of money, and they said, go make it work. So you're like, I am personally responsible to go make it work for you. Like, holy crap. And I still remember, Scott, you're online. He helped us negotiate the term sheet as we were doing this graduating at the same time. Like, um, so for me, I guess this simple answer is, it's just really just uh, like, you don't want to let anybody down. And it's awesome to do this journey with other individuals like Alex and then Chris and Andrew in the last one, like you're all dependent on each other. Like you all want to make sure all of us succeed at the same time. So you very much are driven to make sure you take care of everybody else. You know, Stan, this is Scott. You know, I just, I want to remind you because it was so long ago, you got the highest grade, I think, in the undergrad venture capital class. And then three months later, you had this term sheet and said, you know, I better understand these anti-dilution provisions and the liquidation preference provisions a little bit more because now it really matters. So, you know, a little bit of a difference between school school and the school of hard knocks uh, i thought it was awesome and i will say the first term sheet to the term sheet that when we went to scout my god did we learn a lot 
And Andrew helped a lot on that one because he came in through his, because Andrew's also the same class as me with him. Man, that guy, he came in and was like, <laughs> you learned so much so quickly. <laughs> very, very much so. Absolutely. Alex, I don't know, for, for you? Uh, for me, it's customers. I think it, it's so important to really be passionate about the people that you're doing the work for. Uh, and I think that that's something that we've done really well at Scout we, and, and at Onesys as well. And even Oweb Tech before that, we were just really focused on our customers and really wanted to make sure that they were happy and we were passionate about it. And not just, you know, checking the box and doing the work, but really making a uh, true connection with the customers, learning about their needs, what they want, anticipating those things, and then delivering on it. Um, you know, business has ups and downs, but if you're really passionate about what you're doing and who you're doing it for, and you feel like you're lifting the industry higher, um, and you're doing good things for the world, then, you know, it's really easy to wake up every day and be excited about what you're doing. Chris? Yeah, I would echo what Alex said you get down kind of in the, the slog of there's a bunch of bugs and how do we solve these things? But then you go out and talk with the customers and realize that what you've launched actually makes a difference for their lives, particularly, I mean, we were dealing with sourcing people who don't necessarily have a lot of um, vendors or, or software that's really focused on them. And so when we could go talk with them and realize that, Hey, we saved, we saved you this amount of time, or you were able to go home and have dinner with your family because you had a system that worked for you. To me, that, that was what really kind of pushes you through during that, some of the hard times too. I would agree with 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 all everything that's been said. The thing I'll add is um, we've we always seem to do a really good job of celebrating small victories. And um, as I went uh, went along, one of the ones that stands out in particular was when we we had our first customer actually pay us some money. And um, one of them, in fact, was a uh, um, it was actually a, a nationally owned retailer, but the um, the first check that we got or the, the first subscription that we got was for $79 a month per user. And we were just, that was somebody who's willing to pay us money for what we built. That was a really big uh, mental milestone. And you can kind of um, back it into the, the startups, never even successful ones are never like rocket ships. That's exponential growth rocket ships. They move and grow in stepwise function. And just every step along the way, we had a lot of those uh, small victories that we, we shared with one another. And that was, um, that keeps things interesting day to day, week to week. Thank you, guys. And we're going to get back to a little bit of your Gnosis Genesis story in a bit. But in the meantime, I want to call on Morris Wheeler, who's got a question. Oh, I thought oh, boy. you could just ask it, um, but all right, I'll ask it. Um, so for all the panelists, kind of one of the, looking back, what was the single most important decision that you made that helped catalyze your company's growth and success? Alex, you want to kick it, kick it off? Sure. Very early on, we, like very, very early on, one of the things that we did is we set our culture and we just laid out our values together as a team. And it really worked throughout, even, even now, uh, and we're, we're learning to integrate into workplace values, but like even now, the values that we have are still really strong within the scout cohort. Uh, the and those values were, they provided us an operating system that allowed us to go really quickly. And um, there were things that we put in there around that, that really talked about what our culture stood for. And the first thing was obsessed over the customers. And then we had things like A players only. And so, you know, just throughout the day, it really became ingrained in what we were doing and, and told everybody what we were about. Uh, our strategy really changed over the years, but the, the main tenets of our culture didn't, and it helped us to succeed. Uh, I think that being methodical and thoughtful about that early on was, was one of the key catalysts. Stan, what do you think? Um, spot on with, with the values. We had it on the walls. We had it everywhere. We lived and breathed it. We used examples of it. I think that's really important. I think one other area that we 
uh, and you and I were just even speaking about this, is being incredibly prescriptive on how you want to go to market. Like you can go scorch earth and, hey, we're going to be all things to everybody. We're going to take a dollar everywhere. And a lot of credit to Chris and, and the product vision on this one when we went in and we said, hey, we're like it's Scout RFP. And like everybody even looked at us and they were like, why are you doing RFPs? They suck. Like, why are you, like, just the, 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 the focus. And then what we did is we solved how to make our piece simple and easy. And, um, you know, you're still, I was, I was doing a demo yesterday with Cisco Foods, right? And Johnson & Johnson just signed up. And it's like, like, just this past quarter, and they literally bought us for the RFP engine and paying us half a million, you know, paying us an absurd amount of money. Like, just focusing on a problem and really setting that vision straight versus saying like, yeah, we could do everything for everybody and be very, very organic and be very strategic and high growth. So versus saying yes to everybody, it's like, no, we're building a product that's for high adoption, easy to use, and we are gonna stick to that. Though there's dollars to be flung around here, here, everybody's gonna tell you 10 things that you should go do the next day as soon as you launch a product, but it's just having conviction in that. Um, and I know Chris has been challenged and I'm the worst at this where I'm like, Chris, we need to build all these things. And Alex and Chris are like, no, like we need to focus. And so I agree with them now in hindsight. <laughs> there was a lot of telling Stan, no, we can't sell that right now. <laughs> um, and I, I would definitely echo what Alex said. It was, it was setting our, our cultures and our values and making it clear some of the, the priorities there. And that the number one was obsess over the customer because that enabled us on the product team to, to look at things and say, does this really move the needle for our customers? Or is this just chasing some deal get and might only focus on one person, but how do we make sure that we have the simplicity to get our customers to actually use it? And by, by defining those, those values and making it really clear that our number one job is to obsess over the customers, everything else can kind of fall into place that I would say that made a huge difference throughout the life of the company. It forces you to focus too. Yeah. You can't, you can't have all types of customers love you. If you're really committed about making sure that customers love you, you have to be very honed in on who your customers are, which means saying no to some. Yeah, and, and it also lets you, you grow that really slowly as you do gain new customers because we weren't targeting them, but they realized that, hey, this works in healthcare or this works in some other industry that we, we weren't looking at. We could slowly expand that. Just More a, a quick follow-up. Was, was that whole idea of setting um, culture and values, something that you did and learned at Onesys, or was it a lesson that you took from the Onesys experience? It was a lesson that we took from the Onesys experience. It, every company has a culture, so you're going to have a culture no matter what. And it's and even if you whatever, regardless of what values you put up on the wall, uh, people are going to default to what leadership is doing. So, you know, we had a great culture that was set organically at Onesys, but uh, it, it was organic. And there were some things that we just didn't align on at the beginning that we saw, like as the company grew, we didn't fully love. And so we thought, you know, this going into Scout, we really want to make sure that we do it thoughtfully. And, and as we scale, we'll have a company that we're really proud of and love. Um, and in and, and all the, the values respects. But it also, it did force us to align as a leadership team very early on and make sure that we were all on the same page about how things would be run. Um, because after, over time we were all managing people and it was important that all of us were doing it the same way, at least in the same, uh, with the same values, everybody's gonna have a different style. Yeah, great question, Morris. Morris, just to piggyback on that really quick, there's there's one thing that I think that we did exceptionally well that I see a lot of uh, teams sometimes skip, and that is in the very beginning, we were, the four of us had a lot of really good personal conversations about what we all wanted out of being in a startup. Like, why, why take these risks? What are the rewards that we're really going after? Um, and, it, and it really helped us when things would come up, like, why should we go raise money? How much should we raise? Should we do it in Cleveland or, or Silicon Valley? Should we sell? Um, there's a lot of those things that come up. And what kind of animal do we want this, this venture to ultimately be? And um, four-person founding teams, they're out there, but they're, they're not the most common way to do it. Um, and I think that that helped us tremendously as we went through um, to always have this united front when these, when these challenges would come up. 
Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, for our next question, I'm going to turn it over to Scott Fine. Professor Fine, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I'm curious, you know, we could talk endlessly about um, what happened while you were running the company. And I know that's uh, of great interest to a lot of folks. I want to focus really more on the front end as you develop your financing strategy and capital raise uh, philosophy, both first at Onesis and then your exit to group on at Onesis. And what you learned from that as you entered your second venture, uh, did you change? I, this is a loaded question, Stan, because you and I talked about this, but did you change your financing strategy? And what about the exit? Was there a different philosophy after having gone through it once? You want to grab this one, Stan? I can start off, yeah, and then I'll jump in. And, and Andrew, I know you helped. I mean, Andrew is sort of behind the scenes actually running all these things, truthfully. So um, ultimately, 100%, Scott, yeah, we definitely changed. And I could tell you, you know, when we even, it's, um, and I want to be mindful I say this, but it's, uh, uh, you know, Scout was like sort of like, I don't want to say, well, Onesis was high school for us or, or even early college, but like how we thought about it. It's like when you're learning in life. And then when you got to, when you got to starting, when we started going really quickly to venture and out to Silicon Valley, the term sheets, I, I remember Alex, when we did our first term sheet and we brought it to our lawyers in Cleveland and he looked at it and he's like, I don't really have anything to mark up on this thing. It's like the cleanest term sheet I've seen ever given to, to a startup here. Cause it's just a very different set of asks and different, um, different philosophies and how they do money out and really in the West coast versus in the Midwest. And, and for us, we really learned very quickly on, um, uh, and just sort of what to focus on. And I can tell you like the first one, when we did, there was like liquidation preferred series, uh, like uh, investment was done based on milestones. Like that was all in day one and day two, when we did an act two, it's like, we was very straightforward. It's like, here's the term, uh, here's, uh, we're not gonna do liquidation preferences. It was just very, very clean. And as we, we sort of, Alex and I at least, uh, and, and Andrew and Chris, we sort of follow a very straightforward model uh, and it sort of helped us. It's treat your VCs like you would your customers, right? Like, like love them, support them, keep them updated on what you're doing, have converse, meaningful conversations with them, stay engaged with them, don't always go to them just for when you need money. Like that, 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 that's not a recipe for success. So that's a recipe for, hey, I'm gonna get the best deal. Like, so may create that. And, and when you do need money, oftentimes we've been fortunate where the conversations and the ongoing updates, um, out of all of our raises, I think only one, well, actually, no, they all started to start to happen in more of a serendipitous fashion. Uh, they actually came to us uh, just because we kept the conversations alive. We kept them updated on progress. Great investors can see something coming and they're going to jump in today's market very, very quickly. So it was a very different approach uh, versus when we did the, the first round, like we actively went to go to try to raise money and like it was a very different process. Alex, I'm pretty sure you got some more to add on to that. Hey. I think, uh, I mean, you bring up a good point, uh, and then, and, and a lot of, uh, truth in that would also what Andrew said about in terms of approach very, very early on having the conversation about the type of company that we want to build. And then that leads you to the, how do you want to fund growth? And so very early on, we had the conversation around, like, we, we want to go quickly. Um, and as a result, you know, we're, we weren't, too afraid of dilution if we could spend the money efficiently. Uh, and so the, like, really when we looked at the business from a financial standpoint, you know, we looked at it as a, like, how efficiently can we convert investor capital into, uh, into annual recurring revenue, which would obviously fund the rest of the business and our growth and, and help us raise additional capital as well. So very early on, we, we kind of made this conscious decision that we were going to rely on VC funding and that that did drive how we built the business to some degree. Um, and then to Stan's point, the other philosophy that we had early on was um, that we never wanted to be raising capital because we were planning on always raising capital. So, it, you know, pretty much even at, right after we'd raise a you know pretty good size round and knew we didn't have to worry about things for the next couple of years, we would still continue to build relationships with VCs that we and partners that we really respected and wanted to grow uh, and potentially have it be investors later on down the road. And to Stan's point, every single investor that invested in us, invested in us preemptively, but 
we had been establishing those relationships over years. So it wasn't like they just met us and they wanted to put money in. It was love at first sight. It was, it was really a relationship that we'd built over years with every single one of them. We've been pre-selling them for quite a while on us. So when the conversation or just, it, it didn't, they were like, can we put money in? Be like, what? Wait, act surprised. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and sort of build it from there. And, and that even went into, and with Workday, because Workday became an investor um, at the in Series C round, and, uh, and, and I mean, it's the same conversation. We never wanted to sell the company at this point. Like we just, we didn't have that desire, but at the same time, like you've got a big heavy company over here, like and you're going to treat them like, like, a, like they literally were actually a customer, but you're going to keep them updated. You're going to keep them in the loop. And, and another preemptive um, actually raise triggered this whole entire conversation, which led to us joining Workday. Thank so you the, the other the other side of that though is the exit. Contrast your exit to Groupon versus the sale to Workplace. Yeah, I, that was. I mean, um, yeah, I, Alex. I don't know if you want to chat, but it, it was night and day. I mean, it's a uh, you know when, when we did the deal, the early deal it was. Uh, uh, I think it took like nine months, and it was just like they were also a high growth startup, so they were figuring it out. Um, there was just a lot of uh, it is. It, it, I think we got sued by patent trolls twice during, it was like, it was a very emotional time back then uh, when we did that deal. Uh, but ultimately what the biggest difference was, there wasn't a pure strat. I think they like, it was an opportunistic like, acquisition where they thought they sort of had a vision with this particular, like we came in, um, we had a chance to like have a very set strategy was in place. Like we knew what we were going to go do that we, we, we asked for a much higher dollar amount because we knew the impact that we were going to have on the market together. We knew where we we're going. We had a proven mission because we also don't forget we were a series, we were, we were a venture company for a year with them. So we were able to show them the value of what scout can do, the power of how we work together. And then the acquisition itself. I mean, it's, you know, again, night and day with like a professional team that came in a uh, professional process. They knew how to do it. Andrew, how long did it take? I mean, we were, from like offer to this was, and we got delayed by a few weeks and for, for, for stupid reasons, but, uh, but we could have done this deal, what, in two, less than two months, if it actually. A couple months, a couple months yeah. and 30 days to close. Very different. Thank you guys. Our next question is gonna be coming from Aaron George. So Aaron, if you wanna unmute yourself. Hey guys, uh, hope everyone can hear me. Yep. Uh, yep. Just had a small question with respect to, you know, when you guys actually were negotiating with different VCs, uh, what traction metrics did you use to justify such a high valuation? Um, yeah. High is all relative. I'll just say that right off the bat. Very um, reasonable valuations. <laughs> I, I, Alex and uh, Andrew, you jump in. I, I think for there's a few. That it just I think it's very specific to also the VCs and what they care about. You gotta you gotta know your VCs and you gotta know what like what they're focusing like what what like they'll tell you what they focus on. I mean, but ultimately you look at just sheer product growth, customer satisfaction, and then just uh, for us, revenue is always a driver. Like we always fundamentally look how fast we could add revenue and the unit economics. And Andrew was a wizard at this, um, just putting together like. Here's an Alex's point of we were going to be a VC company. We put in this much cash. This is how much reoccurring revenue we'll look to generate out of it. I'll let the group chime in. You, you'll, you mean, you'll find that the metrics will be different based on your, your business model and based on the stage that you're in. In general, the, the closer you get to series C and D, the more metrics they look at. And the earlier you are in a C round or A round, they're more looking at the team, the market, potential, your product, and, and what kind of pains you're solving. Um, and, and different VCs will have completely different metrics that they look at based on their own success stories and what's in their past. I think the important thing is um, that you understand your business model and what the key drivers are and, and don't get there's a million different metrics that are out there. Just find the ones that really matter to us. It was our ability to generate recurring revenue and, and have unit economics that work. Um, 
and we just went for bear valuations. We we and often um, optimize for having the best partner. Um, we ended up getting really really good valuations, but we also knew that that can easily be, end up being a double edged sword because you then have to go out and you have to achieve that valuation in order for your next round to be a success. In the long run, if you get a fair valuation, it should work out, was our philosophy on it. Awesome, thank you guys. I know we've mentioned a lot about Enosis during uh, your guys' responses. So I wanted to dive into that a little bit and hear a little bit from you guys about really the start of that and um, how you got your first customers and maybe some early challenges that you faced. Oh, you want to grab it? Sure. I, so Onesis came out of, we, we started a web development company called OWeb Technologies with Oleg Friedman. This was also as case students when we were freshmen. And then we, uh, but we knew we wanted to get into enterprise SaaS uh, as we, as much as we love being consultants and building websites and, and software for uh, different projects for different companies and as interesting as that was, um, sorry, the benefits of being home with kids. Uh, the, um, the one thing is we really wanted that recurring revenue model and we really wanted to focus on one industry and then Rascal House Pizza asked if we could build their their website with online ordering in it. And this was early on before all these restaurants had online ordering. And we thought, you know, this is, yeah, we're, you know, case students, we loved Rascal House, we loved pizza, we loved ordering late at night. Um, and we really thought that was, that was a great idea and that more restaurants needed that. And then as far as getting the, the uh, first customer goes, I'll just say that regardless of what business you're in, it's always clawing and scratching for your first one. Can I, is Scott again, can you talk, my recollection is a long time ago, wasn't your first big uh, Kahuna Panera? Weren't you guys fighting for one of the regional Panera franchisees? I mean, that, that was like the big thing, right? Yeah, Panera was hands down one of, the, I think at the time, the biggest thing, because I remember a thermometer and every, we would launch like hundreds of Paneras at a time and the thermometer would keep going up in the office. Yeah, that was, that was hands down the biggest one. We got some I think Outback might have come before then, uh, Outback Steakhouse. That was another big one for us. Uh, but yeah, Panera and Outback were the two big ones that sort of said, hey, we're a pretty legit company. And then five years to sell Applebee's, but we did it. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to call on Reynold next. Reynold has a question. Uh, I would like to ask about the single most obstacle that you had uh, while you had to implement the supply chain initially and how did you overcome it? And is your question specifically around product and the challenges of supply chain? Of the supply chain. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, Chris, maybe, maybe you'd like to take this one as you were, you were leading product. Yeah, I'm trying to think through what the, the single biggest issue would have been. It seemed like there was just a, a constant flow of them here and there. Um, I, I would say initially it was, it was probably figuring out how we build an engineering team. And we ended up building a completely remote engineering team. The vast majority of our engineers are actually out of Latvia. Um, and figuring it, making that decision, kind of committing to it and building building those processes, I would say is probably one of the hardest things that we, we had to go through with building the product. Chris, I think one thing that you and the team did incredibly well is you, so when you look at most supply chain products and this is something that we did uh, led by Chris and Andrew very early, early on is we went and we spoke to hundreds of customers and you know, like our first value was obsessed over the customers. And when you looked at the supply chain products that exist today and, and existed back then, they were very complex and they were designed to solve these really complex problems, um, typically for supply chain. And what would end up happening because of the complexities is that people weren't using them. And you only get that, you know, when you first look in the industry, you look at, you know, maybe there's this, tool that's 10x better and will help save up, you know, 10x more. And what's the real insight there? And the insight that 
Chris and, and Andrew and Stan and I came across was that basically there were a ton of really great, super complicated, um, very robust tools out there, but customers weren't using them because they were just too hard to use. And sometimes that complexity also oftentimes caused those tools to not work very well. And so uh, one of the, I, I think the, big, the biggest challenge that we faced, and we face this still every day as we build a product, is how do you maintain a really simple, usable product as you continue to layer in uh, the, you know, the capabilities that you need to, to, to really provide value? Um, we we set very early on our our litmus test was no user manual, no training required in order to use our RFP tool, which is a really high bar, uh, especially when you compare really in, in any kind of software, but especially when you compare it to the enterprise software that we were up against early on. And so customers would very quickly tell us that you know we certainly didn't have any of the the super fancy features that our competitors had like SAP and Oracle, but our tool was a pleasure to use, and that was what we we optimized and focused on. And, and Chris did a phenomenal job driving the team towards that uh, towards that North Star. And and to Alex's point there, um, that it does go back to our values. And and on the product, we always we set out. Um, I think the term we used early on was monastic simplicity, and then we referred to it as the, the du chevaux, which is a very silly, practical French car that is all break because it has nothing that can go wrong with it. And that's really what we what we set out to build. And so every day it was a can we can we launch this this product without those features, or can, what can we trim out of this every single every single release and every single product that we build. A lot of discipline to get that done, Chris. A lot of discipline, a lot of dealing with my shenanigans of adding more stuff in. Uh, this is Bob Sopko. I uh, wanted to share a couple things from the history with these guys. Um, and some funny stories um, of some of the shenanigans that Stan would pull. Um, <laughs> and I use your story, and I, hopefully it's true, when you were trying to sell um, – the online pizza ordering for fifty dollars a month, and you're getting pushback, so you change the price to two dollars a day. Yeah, that was after Alex's idea. Uh, oh, yeah, we really? did. Uh, we we actually flipped it. We because we did the transaction model, and it was more expensive than sixty dollars. And we were like, because everybody kept pushing back on the transactions, so we just flipped it and said, hey, let's make it two bucks a day versus fifty dollars plus transaction. And people are like, how do you guys make money? It's so cheap. Yeah, and and the the customer could understand. Hey, for two bucks a day, I sell one pie and. I can pay for it. I can't hire someone for two bucks a day. So I do share that. And also um, to these guys credit, they were very, very, very cautious of watching the money of the investors as if it was their own, never using the full half a million um, that I, I'm aware of uh, that was invested and they were basically living off the capital. So much so that the three of them would share a hotel room on a regular basis and were um, and, and got a <laughs> and in Atlanta got a hotel room for two of their investors to share together, and then the investor said, "Well, wait a minute, no, we get our own hotel rooms." So it was a Motel Six too. It was a Motel Six, <laughs> yeah. right? And and then and then when when they got their own hotel room, they texted each other saying, "I miss you guys" because they had all had their own room. So just just some fun little. Uh, the first time we did that was post acquisition when Living Social bought us and. Uh, that they booked us rooms for the trip up there, and we were all just yeah. in our rooms, just like by ourselves. Like, well, this is this is boring. You guys are gonna go and meet in the lobby. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's an important value as well as just that attention to detail and being frugal, uh, especially in in expenditures that don't matter. And what that allows you to do is really invest in the areas that do. So. I mean, fancy office space doesn't matter much if you go out and visit your customers a ton, which is what you should be doing in enterprise sales. And you know, we always optimize for, for making sure that we had great people and making sure that we really took care of our customers. Um, and of course, great people take care of their customers uh, really well. So um, you know, we, we always invested well in those areas. And then everything else, we, we tried to watch our pennies on uh, so that we could focus the the funds in the right place. And we, we certainly did that at Anonysis as well. Right. And, and that sends a message to everybody. So, and also, why don't you share the orange shoes, Stan? Uh, it just, uh, that was just, that was a more of a fun thing. So we were at these trade shows and we were early on in the first few and like, 
it was just like one of these funny things. I was like, I was like, you know, we're at these trade shows. There's no way to stand out. You're pretty much all like you can do different things. So I was like, you know what, guys, I'm going to get a, cause orange was our color was the brand's color. So I was like, I'm just going to get a pair of orange shoes. And I'm like, do, you, do any of you want this? Both Alex and Oleg just sort of looked at me and they're like in this horrific look, like, I don't want to be caught dead around you. If you're wearing these, like these Italian loafers, which I got for like $30 or somewhere on Amazon. I put them on and people were like, love the shoes, love the shoes. So I was like, all right, I'll just keep doing these, even though I look like a goofball. So a few trade shows later, people started referring to us as like, oh, like you got to talk to the, to this, like the, the orange shoe guy, just go talk to the orange shoe guy. And then and that sort of became a thing and orange shoe. And we, we, we increased our style. We got some Converse that were, that were more orange or just a little bit more cooler as time went on. And it became a cultural thing where at that time, uh, so orange shoes became a thing that every employee got to like customize their own pair of orange shoes. And any trade show we went to, we were always dubbed the orange crew. Like, so it just sort of worked for us. Just sort of a way to stand out. <laughs> Thank you guys. Our next question is going to be coming from Dean Malhotra. So Dean. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the first firms that I visited after taking over as the Dean in 2017 was yours. I vividly remember that uh, visit and, uh, and it was impressive to see all the things on the walls. So first of all, congratulations on your uh, success in growing the company as well as uh, taking it to where it is right now. And uh, I remember, um, uh, in the conference room, uh, I think maybe it was uh, Stan, you took the chalk and uh, uh, elaborately drew out the valley of death and how firms need to kind of negotiate through it. And uh, and uh, I think that's a pressure that most uh, entrepreneurs face. So I was wondering if you can share with the audience as to how you went through your own valley of death and, uh, and actually successfully came out of it and uh, managed to keep the enterprise together. I think it was a very impressive story and uh, I just wanted you to share with everyone today. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and it was good. It was great seeing you then. I don't remember all of that exactly. So your question is, how did we like met with debt in particular? No, no, no. I'm saying that you, you folks kind of, uh, I think, uh, drew out that value of death and how important it is for entrepreneurs to kind of negotiate it well. And so some experiences with that and some lessons learned so that others in the audience can uh, grow from your experiences. Yeah, um, and, and and I almost want to, Andrew, I don't know if you, because uh, Andrew's sort of been the, the gap person that's helped us quite a bit on that side of the house and, and helped us. Andrew, do you want to chime in a little bit? Then I'll, I'll, I'll come in as well. On our um, gap facility, like how we looked at that? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think that'd be good. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you are in the right um, if you have the right amount of st stability in your business, debt can be cheaper than equity if you negotiate the right terms. Um, and um, there's a particular class of debt out there called um, uh, venture debt, which you could typically get after you raise a round of, of funding. And, and usually what they're lending on is the expertise of the venture capital firm that, uh, that backs you. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend it for all situations, um, but it is, it is, uh, no business has ever really gone out of money, gone out of business because they've had too much money. So it's always good to have the extra, um, uh, purchasing power, but it's, it's one of those things where, um, it, it's debt, you got to pay it back. So you have to be very clear about what the scenarios are for why you want to use this money. Like, how would you deploy it? How do you expect to get the money back? And um, from from having gone through it, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't recommend it unless you had a very clear idea of what your economics are. We knew what our unit economics were. We knew that if we um, spent at do X dollars on a on a salesperson or a marketing team, that and so many months later we were going to get Y dollars of of cash back, and we knew how to pair that up with the amount of debt and pay off an interest um, schedule that we would have to, to um, maintain. And so we did actually use debt um, and we paid it off. Um, and um, it worked out quite well for us in, in our case. And, and to add on to a little bit is it's, you definitely wanna be smart about it. Debt's just another option. 
ultimately for us, we, as Alex mentioned, we use ventures are really our driver. We always said we want to be more of a venture driven company. So we use that. We always uh, basically, Andrew, we started, I think after series A, we basically are series or even we, 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 we used, we had a deadline always created and we've always had that as, as an organization. Uh, but it's sort of your safety net and it gives you a lot more lever in the negotiation with VCs. Because when the nice thing about that is when you tell a VC, it's like you've got 10 million in the bank, but you, your venture arms got, an, you've got access to another 10 million ready to go. And you can pull that. That really makes the VC think like, like you've doubled your runway now. So being able to have those in the negotiation tool belt when you're going through those conversations, it's very important. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, it's as soon as you get, that's really good when, as Andrew alluded to, is when your unit economics makes sense. Because that's when you can, you know that if you're going to hire X number of salespeople or deploy X number of dollars on marketing, you're going to get X number back. Like that becomes a very powerful thing later on. Uh, but always, it, it, it's relatively cheap when you can start putting in these deadlines when you are, uh, when you've got some venture funding. I definitely wouldn't do it day one because it's too expensive. I would use just good old angel investing or, or, or just or VC early uh, VC. Uh, to get going, they won. And, and swap the equity for that funding. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next question is going to come from Michael. So, Michael, if you want to unmute yourself. Hey, everyone. I'm Michael. I'm a, I just finished my first year. I actually called um, Alex my first semester at Case. I don't know if you remember. And I, got, I did the to-do list you told me to do, and it, it's been helpful a lot. Uh, so thank you for that. But um, my, my question today for you guys are, what are the biggest failures and setbacks you guys had encountered in your entrepreneurship journey? And what have you guys been able to learn from them? Thank you. Definitely. And uh, I still do my to-do list every day as well. So uh, that's awesome. And have for years and years. So it's awesome that you, you picked that up. It will serve you well. Um, well I, I, so one thing that I'll say in, in terms of failures, I think we as a group have failed uh, more, like as much if not more than just about like any other group that I've really ever encountered in entrepreneurship. Like we just took a lot of, um, you know, we experimented a lot and we took a lot of uh, chances in growing the business. Um, and they were, we took calculated, risks but we you name the area of the business and and i'd say we've made like a, a fair amount of mistakes there and and that kind of in the beginning andrew and chris both talked about how uh resilience was one of the things that we really had from the beginning and the ability to bounce back from those those challenges so anyway just know that none of the short of mistakes that are are fatal like it's it's okay every business experience is a a, a ton of mistakes um, I think we all probably have our, uh, our ones that, that we would choose, but one thing that if I could go back and, um, and, and change earlier on, there's a book called Crossing the Chasm, which really talks about uh, finding a beachhead early and then knowing, uh, and then really focusing on those particular customers. I would say we, we did pick a customer early on uh, but we we were a little hesitant to um, go with the super focused strategy in the very very earliest days, uh, and you can't super early on because you you're not sure who's going to benefit the most, and it, it's important to experiment and make sure that you you find that one beachhead. But um, it, once we kind of determined the once we had about like 30 40 customers, we knew who was getting the most value out of our products and services, and it was a little bit probably took us about you know six months before we truly committed to that customer and um persona and really just focused on them and so as a result for, you know for about six months we we did do a little bit of wandering of what kind of product to build what's the next extension you know who are we really focused on and six months uh at the beginning of your company it, it's it, it's a really long time and um it, I, it was costly so i think the next time when we go to do things uh again should we ever decide to do that we one of the things that I would I would want to do earlier on is identify who that customer persona is, and then uh, go all in and focus on them really heavily. Um, Andrew, Chris, Dan. Um, I would I would agree with that. Figuring out that beachhead of of who do you really want to go after. 
Awesome, cool. awesome. Thank you, guys. I've got so one last question to wrap up the session. Uh, you guys have accomplished a lot coming out of Case with your own startup, uh, developing Scout, and now where you are uh, selling to selling your company. So you've accomplished a lot. You've done a lot. What's next for you guys? Great question. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll start and then, uh, but I uh, guess for us uh, and uh, the reality is that Workday is a very unique organization uh, in the world today. When you, when you think about just sort of enterprise software, um, you know, 15 years to build a $50 billion company, a little less now market cap, but let's call it 50 billion market cap uh, uh, just, uh, just less than a year ago. And um, for what, they're sort of the new wave of enterprise software. And we've sort of joked amongst the, the four of us that, you know, we've sold into big enterprise our whole lives and, uh, and we've never actually worked at a big enterprise. So it's one of these moments where we, we can actually come in and learn a lot. So in, in Workday did pay up for Scout, just, just to be clear, like, you know, we're, we, we think we're very special. Don't get, don't get us wrong. Um, but we, we definitely have a big vision there. And we want to help develop the spend pillar at Workday. Uh, so it's a huge opportunity. Do, or am I going to say what's, you know, do I know what I'm going to be working for the rest of my life? Absolutely not. Uh, I can't say that. But uh, we, we definitely have a commitment and, uh, and, and a vision there that we want to make sure that we stand up and deliver on. Uh, so for the, for, the, for the next several years, for us, we're going to go execute on that. Uh, I don't know if Alex, you deviate too much from that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, just to, there was another question around like, the exit and how maybe it was different from the, you know, from the Honest's exit. And the, the big thing with, with both of them, but this particular is true of Workday, uh, is they have these really strong values, which we aligned with from the beginning. And so, um, as Stan said, we, we, it was enough, like we, we weren't looking to be acquired and it, it kind of came along and it made sense. Uh, but what a big part of that calculus, maybe the biggest part of that calculus was the, the culture that Workday has and the vision that they have for the space. And so, you know, the, it, it's something that we are really excited about, something that was easy to get behind, uh, not just for the, the four founders, but really our entire executive team, our entire company. Um, and it, it really, the way we view it is, it's a continuation of our mission, but on a much larger platform. And so I think all of us are now pretty stretched to uh, learn and figure out how to navigate and grow something much much bigger on a much bigger platform and it's it's a different game and it it's hard in its own separate way and it's it's really interesting and and uh, a good challenge so i think we're you know i think we're we're going to be heads down learning how to do that and, and trying to build something pretty big and something pretty special Yeah. Well, maybe we'll be back in a few years talking about how to to grow a massive arm at a very, very big public company. I am learning how to deal with meetings. That is, that is a new skill that I am trying to develop myself. Yeah. And how to find the right people. How to find the right very, people. Very different system. And how one meeting, one, one thing that you take one meeting realistically takes about 25 now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Morris said, better to learn how to avoid meetings. So true. I will say being remote uh, and having, having this experience of being forced to go remote uh, has actually been a, a real blessing because we, you know, before it was kind of like all about how you, you know, proximity to people or how you could walk to certain offices or if you could bump into the right person in the hall. Um, even if you were in the right hallway and now it's so easy, you just, you, you could be much more methodical and, and selective about making sure that you're, you could just reach out and grab 15 minutes with, on, with somebody on Zoom because you certainly won't be in the same hallway for quite a while. Um, so anyway, it's been, uh, it, 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 it's been really good in terms of building connections and building relationships, uh, even if you can't do that over a coffee. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys, for your time today. And thank you, everybody, for attending. I'm going to give it back to Michael Goldberg now, who's going to wrap up the session. Great. Igor, thank you so much for moderating. You did a great job. Um, it was uh, well attended before when we were getting on. We were wondering how many would show up. And this is one of our best attended sessions. So uh, 
thank you um, for everybody who joined us. Um, just sort of looking at just two quick announcements. One is we've got uh, a number of, every week with our speaker series, we have a number of different sessions. Um, on Friday, tomorrow at noon, or at one o'clock, we've got um, the students from our uh, prize program. This is our program rewarding innovation and STEM entrepreneurship. So these are female entrepreneurs on campus that are gonna be presenting, that's at one o'clock. And then next week we'll be back um, with two other speakers, Jeff Stotland, who's a friend of mine from, um, from business school, who's the VP of strategy and global development at the Walt Disney Company. I'll be talking about what Disney is facing in the crisis um, and they're facing a lot. And then on Wednesday at one o'clock, uh, Hallie Sh Kogel shots from uh, Shark and Minnow um, is a great local entrepreneur has done some work with us in the online learning space. We'll be talking. So we've got a number of programs. The other thing I'll mention for those who are on, um, we are launching or we have launched what we're calling a remote entrepreneurship project program. This is aimed at, we have a growing number of students, awesome students that are um, for a variety of reasons that one can understand losing their summer internships. Um, so we're looking to partner with entrepreneurs that may have projects that our students can work on so that they can get valuable experience. We're funding that from the university um, with small stipends. So I put a, a, a form for any entrepreneurs or anybody that you guys know that might be looking for a case student to work on a project this summer, please fill that out. Um, so again, Alex, Stan, um, Chris and Andrew, thank you for doing this. It's great to have you via Zoom, and we do look forward to getting you back in Cleveland on campus as soon as we're not sheltering in place. So thanks, everybody, and, and hope to see you all soon. Take care. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for organizing it, Michael. It's great. Thank great. you. Great to see so many familiar faces. Thanks, everybody.